my audition day comes. Formal newscast is over. The anchors clear the set. They asked me to go up on the set, sit on the chair at the anchor desk. And it was a very different view than my training in the basement of that brownstone with a couple of hanging work lights. There was a whole grid of lighting above me and weight beyond the cameras, the three cameras that were pointing at me. There was all dark space. It, it was cavernous. So they load the script for the sports segment that the news anchor had just read in the uh, live newscast, and they asked me to read it. So here we go. Camera operator, Marty Glombotsky, who later taught me so many neat tricks for shooting video and editing my stories, pulls his head away from the back of the camera, and he raises his hand, and he points to me as if, go. So it's on. <sighs> I read through the prompted script. I stop at the end and I smile into the camera. And Marty sticks his head out from around the camera and he goes, you nailed it. He, he seems surprised. And then I heard some muffled commotion from the people in the control room. I guess they were also surprised. And I get it. How could this guy from the backroom edit station be good enough to be the sports anchor on his very first try? Well, what they didn't realize was that I just went through two classes of training for just this situation. You're listening to the Just Sayin' Podcast, offering conversations with experts that will educate, inform, and entertain. Here's your host of the Just Sayin' Podcast, Charlie Cornaccio. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Just Sayin' Podcast. Today's show focuses on the field of broadcasting. I will share my journey of how I got into the field and the lessons that I've learned along the way. And I will give you five things that you can do to help get your broadcasting career going or whatever field you desire. You can also use these five tips to help you get to the next level in your current job. So I'll be referencing my journey as a television anchor and producer, but a lot of the information that I will share from my story is good and useful information for any type of job. My story reflects on the break that started as a part-time backroom videotape editor and then morphed into a career that spanned over 30 years across the industries of television and radio with the lessons that I've learned along the way. And it's really it's nothing that I sat around and developed. I actually lived it and realized that the circumstances that worked for me could work for you too. So I'll share my journey through my television career. And then when we're done, hopefully you'll have a better understanding of what it takes to seize the moment to get what you want and how to, how to achieve your success. So it's five steps from backroom editor to on-camera anchor. But first, the Just Saying podcast with Charlie Carnaccio is brought to you by New Leaf Hypnosis Center and hypnotist Anthony Serino. Anthony specializes in pain, weight loss, fears, and phobia, and just trying to help you create the best you that you deserve. I have to confess, I had a major addiction to, dare I say it, Oreo cookies. And since my session with Anthony, I have no more cravings for Oreos or sweets of any kind. It's been close to six weeks and I haven't had a single Oreo cookie. Sorry, Nabisco. But them's the facts. So the way Anthony explains it is that it's just a matter of rewiring your brainwaves, which I'm not sure how he does it, but it works if you want it to work. So connect with Anthony and see if he can help you. And the best part about it is that you don't even have to leave your house. Anthony can Zoom call with you and you still can get great results. Okay, <clears throat> so today we're talking about lessons I've learned while breaking into television or the media and what you can do to get your first job in that industry or how to apply it to any job, really. These five tips are universal. And I know it works because I never grew up wanting to be in the media. And I know that that word, media, is somewhat polarizing these days. It used to carry some respect and prestige, but honestly, they have no one to blame but themselves. Quality journalism and reporting is essential to keep the people of our communities informed and essential to holding our elected officials accountable but when the media becomes inconsistent in its reporting or takes a side and pushes its own narrative, it creates bias. It creates division. And actually, it becomes dangerous to us all. 
Because how do you know what facts to side with if you're not getting the full facts and truthful reporting? How do you know if the media is only telling you what they want you to hear? If you check out episode three of season one, I dedicate a whole show to how we as humans are prone to negativity bias and how we gravitate to stories and thoughts that align with our own thinking and how the reporter can sway your reception of a particular story to get your attention. The media knows this, and that's why headlines are so salacious, because they're really the first thing you see. But as you actually read the article, which many of us don't, we've actually become headline readers. But if you do read the entire article, you realize that the urgency of the headline doesn't necessarily match the urgency in the story. But the headline is what gets your attention. That's called clickbait. Sorry, I digress because I'm passionate about the topic, but we are talking about breaking into the industry of broadcast media and my journey from backroom editor to an on-air television anchor. A while back, a good friend of mine, Nicole Pelosi, taught a careers course at one of the local colleges, and she would ask me to be part of the panel of area professionals. And we would go to the class and we would speak and provide advice and direction for them based on our own experiences in our industry, mine being broadcast media. And so it was through creating those presentations for her students that I realized that I have experienced some things along the way that really helped me throughout my career and could help others. Nothing that I formally sat down and created, just steps in looking back that got me to where I am. So here's step number one. Don't think you have to go it alone. I was fortunate enough to work with people, many talented people in the industry, who were all so very generous about sharing their knowledge with me. And I learned a lot in a short period of time. And in 31 years in the business, I'm still learning. And a lot of times, I'm learning from people who have fewer years in the industry than I do. It doesn't matter who it is. We can all learn something of value from anyone. So tip number one, keep yourself open and look out for those teachable moments. During my career, I achieved some great success and milestones. I was awarded seven Tilly Awards, uh, got two Emmy nominations. I was asked to speak at seminars. I achieved a lot of success. The sole reason I tell you that is because all of that recognition was from a collected effort. You see, no one achieves recognition or success alone. No one. And that's lesson number two. Always seek out good help. Don't think that you have to achieve success on your own or it won't count. Because if you try and achieve success on your own, you'll fail. Every single person who has achieved any kind of success achieved it because they had help. Billionaires had help. Great inventors had help. Successful performers had help. The Telly Awards and the Emmy recognitions that I received was earned because I had help. A phenomenal team of talented people working together. And I could not have gotten any of those accolades without all of the guys and girls who worked on the show that garnered those accolades. So rule number two, look out for opportunities where people can help you achieve your goals. For me, TV provided visibility, and that led to opportunities to do some speaking engagements, meet some very cool and interesting people. I was invited to do several radio shows and even got an adjunct professor position at one of the local colleges. So that's how a career can springboard you to all sorts of cool experiences. My career spanned the gamut, and it all came down to this, right place at the right time. I never went to college for journalism or broadcasting. I didn't spend a dime on higher education. It was just good fortune and good timing. But the key is what you do with the good fortune and good timing once it's presented. What I learned in this process helped me and it can help you too. So here's how it happened. In my previous jobs before television, I was working in the furthest thing from broadcast media I was a uh, manager in the industry of supply chain logistics. That's a fancy way of saying warehousing and shipping. 
My real passion was TV and film. And this was a far cry from that. But I got there. And here's how it worked. So I'm working at a distribution center for about eight years. And through those eight years, worked my way up from a warehouse group leader to the manager of the distribution center. But then I was caught up in a company-wide layoff. I didn't see it as all doom and gloom at the time. I mean, I really liked the job and I liked the people that I worked with. But I saw it as an opportunity to maybe find something that better aligned with my true passion, film and television. So while I was the manager at this warehouse, uh, I used to create safety and orientation videos for the staff using a video camera and a deck to deck editing method that I jury rigged. It was crude, but effective. And I really liked the production and editing aspect of that task. So when I got laid off, I started looking through the classifieds for the next job and came across a job posting bold lettering for a videotape editor job. It just jumped off the page at me. And I applied at this local cable company that posted the position in the hopes that the job would pay well enough to support my family. And to make it better, the company was located in walking distance from where I lived. So during the interview, I'd explained that I had this video editing experience because I created those safety training videos. It, it turns out I got the job, but it was only part-time from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. And the job was a commercial reel editor, which means back in the day, way before digital, we used to get a printout of the TV commercials from the ad sales department and had to assemble 30 second commercials onto a three quarter inch tape cassette. And then those commercial blocks would play across the different channels of the cable network, including the local news program that the station was producing. So it wasn't a full-time gig, but I figured that you got to start somewhere. And I started that job in January of 1989 and in March of that same year, a coworker came into my editing booth with a job post that, posting that she pulled off the bulletin board. And she handed it to me and said, you should go for this. Turns out the news department was looking to hire its first ever sports anchor. So three months into this mundane job of editing commercials onto a reel in the back corner of a back room late at night, I had an opportunity to audition for a newly created nightly sports anchor position. Pretty cool, huh? Again, right place, right time. So I filled out my application, brought it into the program manager, and he looked at me and he said, you wanna be on TV? <laughs> of course, he only knew me as the guy who came in from five to 10 and sat in that back corner editing commercial reels. He didn't know that I had done some acting and earned my actor's equity card. He also didn't know that I had another life as a lead singer and bass player for a successful wedding band. But I said, yeah, I, I think I could do it. I played sports. I followed sports. I'm sure I could read sports. So, so he scheduled my audition, which would consist of me sitting on the news desk in the studio and reading from a teleprompter. I had never read from a teleprompter before. And the program manager had told me that the competition would be very stiff because all of the local newspaper sports writers and radio guys would be auditioning as well. So here's tip number three and, and three A. Tip number three, have no fear. Don't pass up an opportunity for fear that it might take you out of your comfort zone or fear of failing. And then 3A is to act confident during that process. And then when no one's looking, you can panic and try to figure out how to get the job done. My entrepreneur friends know that one very well, right? Anyway, in my case, that meant practice. But just how do you practice what you don't know? And how do I do it without access to a teleprompter? In my acting days, I used to pick up a trade paper called Backstage where all the theater, film, and TV auditions were listed. And I remembered seeing an ad towards the back of that trade paper where some woman was promoting her TV coaching business. So I picked up the latest edition of Backstage, which I hadn't looked at for years. And luckily, she was still advertising her service. So I called the woman. Her class is focused on TV performance using a teleprompter. Perfect. 
And she taped each lesson so we could critique it afterwards. Also perfect. It was 125 per session and it was a two class minimum. So I signed up, paid my 250 and timed my classes to be scheduled just before my audition date at the cable company. In the meantime, I started coming to work wearing a jacket and a tie. And that is step number four. Look the part. While my backroom editing job at the station was part time at night, I picked up full time work during the day. So from 8 to 4 p.m., I worked at a day job and then traveled an hour north to get to the 5 to 10 p.m. editing job. And it's rare that a nighttime editor comes in wearing a jacket and a tie, but I wanted them to see me looking the part of a TV anchor before I actually auditioned. When I would arrive for my night shift, the news crew was scurrying around the halls, getting ready to do their live broadcast at 530. And I made sure that I was hanging out by the copier during that time, looking over my sheet with my tie and my jacket. My editing coworkers would laugh and they, they asked me why I was so overdressed. And I told them I was coming directly from my other job, which I was. But of course, that job didn't require that I wore a jacket and tie. So for a couple of weeks leading up to my audition, I was seen in that hallway every night with my jacket and tie, smiling, hi, everybody, looking over my worksheets. And that's kind of how I did it. Meanwhile, my TV class down in New York City was very eye-opening. It was me, the teacher, a camera technician, all smushed into the basement of her brownstone. And while it wasn't a studio, I still learned how to get comfortable with the tempo and the timing of a teleprompter, and even better, how to handle myself if the prompter sticks or shuts down. She was a really good teacher. She really knew her stuff. And one of the things she stressed that I carry with me forever was to never read the words on the prompter screen. Instead, look through the words and visualize yourself talking to one person Pick uh, someone intimate to you. It could be a spouse, a best friend, a sibling, and just talk directly to that one person. What that does is it takes you out of the mindset of thinking that you're talking to the masses with this communication platform and thousands of people watching. And sometimes when we think masses, we automatically think we have to be big, like we have to project. But an intimate delivery is much more compelling and connecting to your audience. So back to my story. My audition day comes. Formal newscast is over. The anchors clear the set. They asked me to go up on the set, sit on the chair at the anchor desk. And it was a very different view than my training in the basement of that brownstone with a couple of hanging work lights. There was a whole grid of lighting above me and way beyond the cameras, the three cameras that were pointing at me, there was all dark space. It, it was cavernous. So they load the script for the sports segment that the news anchor had just read in the uh, live newscast, and they asked me to read it. So here we go. Camera operator, Marty Glombotsky, who later taught me so many neat tricks for shooting video and editing my stories, pulls his head away from the back of the camera, and he raises his hand, and he points to me as if, go. So it's on. <sighs> I read through the prompted script. I stop at the end and I smile into the camera. And Marty sticks his head out from around the camera and he goes, you nailed it. He, he seems surprised. And then I heard some muffled commotion from the people in the control. I guess they were also surprised. And I get it. How could this guy from the backroom edit station be good enough to be the sports anchor on his very first try? Well, what they didn't realize was that I just went through two classes of training for just this situation. So I got the job as the news station's very first sportscaster, which led to a half hour sports show, as well as my nightly sportscasting anchoring duties, which led to me being the color analyst and play by play sportscaster for many of our local pro college and high school teams with live broadcasting, which led to speaking engagements, which led to work at bigger networks, which led to becoming the owner and general manager of my own independent channel called Sports One that was seen in a quarter of a million homes, which led to becoming the executive producer of a magazine show in New York City called Neighborhood Journal, 
uh, numerous industry awards, two Emmy nominations, an adjunct professor position at a local community college, and so much more. And all because, one, I looked for teachable moments. Two, I didn't let fear and failure get in the way. Three, I acted confident. I dressed the part. And I prepared for the moment. Some might say I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time. But I can't agree with that. I can see why they could say that. But I believe two things. First and foremost, God was orchestrating the whole thing for much different reasons than me just getting the TV job. And if you read my book about my adoption and finding my birth mother, you'll see how all the right place, right time pieces fit so perfectly together. And also, because there's no such thing as luck. Have you ever heard that analogy, luck is the intersection where opportunity and preparedness meet? Well, that's what happened. I came upon that intersection with an opportunity, and I made sure I was prepared for it. And so this is the message that I give when I do speak engagements at high schools and colleges. And if you have a son or a daughter or a family member looking to break into the world of broadcasting or any industry, take note of what I'm about to say. In broadcast media and maybe other industries as well, it's all about making the most of every opportunity and learning everything about the business. Learn to be a multiple threat. There are no specialized positions anymore. So you can't really go into it and say, well, I want to be a sportscaster, or I want to be a director, or I want to be an editor, or I want to be a camera person. You really have to be willing to learn a lot of different parts of the overall operation. That way, you bring more to the table than the next applicant. When I was the sports anchor, viewers saw a three-minute, 30-second sportscast each night. What they didn't see was the hours and multiple skills that went into that short three-and-a-half-minute segment. After delivering the sportscast, I would grab all the camera gear out of the equipment cage and go out to cover different sporting events, shooting games for highlights as a cameraman, doing post-game interviews as an interviewer, coming back to the studio, editing the footage as an editor into highlights to tell the story, writing as a script writer to the highlights, researching and collecting the other scores from the other games that happened that night, and then put it all together into that three minute and 30 second sports guest. So you have to be prepared to do whatever it takes to get the job done. You can't be afraid of hard work and you need to know as many skills as you can. Take a look at the job I had as a sportscaster. Uh, I was the camera operator. I was a sportscaster. I was the producer. I was the editor. I was the writer. I was the researcher. One guy, six jobs. And that means I saved the company from hiring five other people. So be multifaceted and you'll be worth your weight in gold to that organization. Another thing. Get an internship at a local TV studio, a cable TV station, a local radio station, and get exposed to everything. Learn everything. Seize every opportunity to learn. I was fortunate that when I had my first job, I had some very talented people, like I said, generous with their knowledge of helping me learn the ropes. Too many times I would see interns from local colleges come in for an internship at our place and sit around waiting for someone to tell them what to do. They would actually sit there in the control room, buried in their phone or homework or whatever, until someone said, hey, can you help me with this? Rather than, hey, can I help you with that? I don't think that getting an internship at a big broadcasting company like NBC or CBS is going to look that great on your resume unless you actually get hands-on experience. Most of those bigger places give you the lunch assignments and the coffee runs, and that isn't helping really anything. You need to get an internship at a smaller place where you can get good hands-on experience and great one-on-one -on -one instruction with people who do this every day. A local entity will help you get that experience. You want a great example of how that initiative can pay off? Check this out. One day, while I was at the news station, I had to go down to the minor league baseball stadium and interview Bump Wills, 
who was the manager of our local minor league Tampa Bay affiliate. I also had to run over to our sister station and pick up some footage of a broadcast game that they shot. And I wanted to use some of the highlights for my sports guests. So I mentioned to the news director that I was headed out and there were these three interns sitting in the control room. One was on her phone. The other one was doing her homework. And then there was the third one sitting by the edit bay in the studio. It wasn't doing anything, but the kid heard that I was headed down to the stadium and he jumped up and asked, can I come with you? Now he was a news intern and this was a sports thing. So I told him to ask his supervisor if it was okay. He got the okay. And um, we went, but I told him I have to make a stop at the other cable system, which is like 40 minutes away before I go to the interview at the stadium. And he was fine with that. So here's what happened. When we got to that other cable station, I asked him to come in and see what the other studio looked like. So you can get, you know, just an appreciation of what they do. We met the general manager. We talked a little bit about last night's game, the broadcast. Then the GM gave me the tape. And as we're walking out, he said, hey, Charlie, you know of anyone who can do stats? We need a stats guy for this Saturday's game. And I looked at the intern. And I said, Mitch, you know how to do stats? And Mitch immediately responded, sure. And that led to Mitch becoming the regular statistician for all broadcasting games. And it was a paying gig. From his stats position, Mitch got a position on the production crew in various other capacities like camera operator, assistant producer, and so on. And you see how that works? So rewind back to the studio when the interns were all sitting around. And imagine how different this story would be if Mitch never spoke up and showed initiative, right? So that's how powerful it is to make the most of your situations and to be on the lookout to recognize those potential opportunities when they arise. I tell that story when I speak to classes and schools to illustrate that you need to be open and available to every opportunity. And you need to be proactive. Don't think of it as an opportunity that if it doesn't fit your exact career path, you're not going to go for it, that it can't help you. The most powerful opportunity you have during an internship and one outside as well is networking. Meet with people, talk with them, make a good impression, show that you want to learn, show that you're not afraid to work hard, show that you want to do. And this is for the younger people out there. There is a corporate world in America that thinks that all you want to do is just get everything handed to you, that you are impatient, that you, if you don't get promoted in the first three months, you're going to walk and move on to something else. Show them that they are wrong. Show initiative. Don't be afraid to work hard and be a sponge. And don't think just because you paid for a four-year degree at a school or a specialized college that it's going to help you get a job in your field. That's the one thing that I really despise about the whole corporate culture that has been created. Corporate America is telling you, you can't work here without a degree. A degree proves nothing. Just because you went to a four-year institution doesn't mean you're anything more than a good SAT taker. College, in my opinion, is the greatest legal scam in our society. Think about it. It's no risk to them and all reward. That's the definition of a scam. Institutions can ask you to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for an education, but then never guarantee that what they taught you will actually help you get a job in the field that you're trying to get a, a job in. That's the definition of a scam. No risk, all reward. You pay me for something, but I don't guarantee that what you paid me for is going to work. And no one can hold me accountable. That's the problem that I have with degrees. Way too much money spent to get it and way too much emphasis put on the fact that you must have it. But in the end, it all amounts to a certificate of completion. That doesn't mean that you're mentally equipped and skilled for the job. Check this out. Back in 2012, I was in line for a huge job at Verizon. Uh, back when Verizon was launching Files One, which is a news outfit specifically created to compete with the other cable companies' subscribers. So the general manager at Files One saw me on TV doing my sports thing and contacted me to be the sports director for their New York City launch. 
But things were moving fast, and as they were ramping up and staffing up quickly, turns out that they hired a guy before I could get down to New York City to meet with the general manager. But as we were going through my resume, she felt I would be a good fit to help her out as an assistant general manager. So the pay would have been a huge bump from what I was making. And I was really excited about it. She instructed me that the job posting wasn't out yet, but that she would give me a heads up when to submit my resume when it was officially online. So the job came online. She sent me an email, told me what the job reference code was, and I applied. And this is always the sticky part for me because when I, I came from a single parent home and then became a father at 19. So I had to drop out of college to work. I didn't go back to college until 1982 at night for a little bit. So I didn't have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree. And whenever I got to that portion of the job application, it would, it would make me cringe because I knew how much emphasis corporations put on a college degree. But I had 24 years of actual television broadcasting experience at that time. So you would think, yeah. Well, I got a call from the general manager saying that my application kicked out of the human resources system because I didn't fill out the education section of the online application. I told her that I did fill it out, but that I didn't have a degree. And she seemed surprised that I never told her about that, but it never came up in, dis in discussion ever. All we talked about was my experience and how I could benefit her in answering questions, the myriad of questions she was getting bombarded with from the field. And remember they were a new outfit. She didn't know the answers to the aspects of this new division they were launching and creating. I did. But the policy of Verizon, as she explained it to me, was that no senior manager can have a senior management position without a four-year degree. And there was no getting around that. So here I was with 24 years of actual day-to-day -day experience in a job that she was trying to wrap her head around with no experience. And they would rather go with someone with less experience just because they had a document that signified that the candidate paid thousands of dollars and sat in a classroom for four years, being taught by professors who probably never worked in a broadcast studio environment every single day for 34, 24 years. Does that make sense to you? Well, it doesn't make sense to me, but that's what our society has created, a billion dollar scam. A few years later, same situation. Local four-year college was looking for someone to teach sports broadcasting as an adjunct professor. The dean of that department was already bringing me in to talk to students about my career and also to run a summer program for high school kids coming to the college from all over the country for a two-week sports journalism camp. So he reached out to me and asked me to send my resume so he could get me into the system and as an adjunct professor at the college. And I, I thought that was great because I already had been an adjunct professor at one of the local community colleges. Long story short, I didn't get the gig because I didn't have a four-year degree, which means that a college would rather hire a kid right out of college with no experience than a guy who actually is performing the subject matter on a daily basis for at that time, it was 26 years. Whose lesson do you think the students would get more out of? The kid with the four-year degree and no experience or the guy with no degree but 26 years of experience? That's what's wrong with the institution of college. I'm not saying colleges are wrong or advocating for anyone to skip the college experience. I'm just saying that there should be an equal amount of commitment from the colleges to the students to give them the best knowledge that they can and put some skin in the game by helping students get the start that they need for, empl for employment. A and if let's say in three years, they can actually help the student through concrete evidence of both parties really giving a good, honest effort, then the college should reduce the loan payback by a certain percentage for each year that the student is not employed. That's fair, right? We need to hold colleges accountable for charging the money that they're charging. How, how do you get to keep raising tuition 
if you can't back it up with statistical successes of employment for your product. Every other company needs to do that. You pay for a product. It needs to work. Why not colleges? And I would also vet the professors. Are they in the position, because like you, they went to college, got a piece of paper? Or can they show examples of contributions that they've made to the subject that they are teaching? In other words, can your sports journalism professor point to a time when they actually got paid to be a sports journalist? Fair question. Can a business professor point to a time when they actually ran a company? You get the idea. There's just too much college debt out there, and it's just not fair to kids looking to get a chance in the working world. They're put into a hundreds of thousands of dollar hole before they even get started. Just saying. So, whew, feels better. To wrap up this whole thing, look for teachable moments. Accept help. Don't pass up on an opportunity for fear of failure. Act confident. Look the part and be prepared for the opportunity when it arises. And if you do those things, you may surprise yourself that you actually find exactly where you want to be. So that will do it for this edition of the Just Saying Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the Just Saying Podcast with Charlie Cronaccio. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you find your podcasts. And you can see the video version on Facebook and YouTube on the Just Saying Podcast with Charlie Cronaccio channel. But you have to type in Just Saying Podcast with Charlie Cronaccio because apparently... There are other Just Saying podcasts out there, and some of them shut down. This one hasn't. Also, just a reminder to check out my book, How I Met My Mother and the Four Brothers I Never Knew I Had. It's an incredible story about the circumstances that led to me finding and meeting my birth mother and the four brothers I never knew I had. And my being a TV sportscaster had a lot to do with making that discovery happen. So you can find that book on Barnes and Noble's website. Uh, people are telling me that Amazon is out of stock. So we're trying to remedy that situation, but check out Barnes and Noble for now. Anyway, thanks for tuning in to the Just Saying Podcast with Charlie Carnaccio. Stay safe, be kind, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Just Saying Podcast. 